When the Allies and Axis troops work together, the Second World War is known for its brutality, with both the Allies and the Axis powers fighting tooth and nail for supremacy. In spite of this, however, there were some incidents in which soldiers from one side actively or inadvertently aided their enemies. Whether this was done out of a sense of morality, ideology, or some reason known only to them, here are a few examples of when Axis and Allies worked together. The Battle of Itter Castle by May 1945, with VE Day just around the corner and the Nazi reign of terror coming to an end, one final battle remained. In the Austrian Alps, Castle Itter was a fortification that dated back to the 13th century. During the war, it was under the administrative control of the Dachau concentration camp, about 90 miles away. The castle was used by the SS to incarcerate high-value prisoners, particularly those who had potential value as hostages, mostly French nationals, including two former prime ministers, as well as several generals and prominent political figures. On May 4th, the guards of Castle Itter abandoned their posts and fled, leaving the confused inmates uncertain about their fate. In the surrounding area were various Gestapo and and SS units, who were executing anyone who attempted to surrender. It was feared that the SS would liquidate these high-value prisoners as a last act of defiance. The prisoners sent two messengers off seeking aid, with one of them finding an American unit. Though it was outside of their operational jurisdiction, a small rescue party led by tank commander Jack C. Lee was dispatched to the castle. The other messenger found Wehrmacht Major Sepp Gangl, a German officer who was disillusioned with the Nazi cause. Both units met up with each other and agreed to work together to protect the prisoners, with Lee placing his Sherman tank at the castle's entrance. The next day, a Waffen SS unit arrived and were met by a combined force of American GIs, Wehrmacht deserters, and a number of French and Austrian prisoners using small arms left behind by Itter's guards. Lee's tank was knocked out, though no casualties were suffered. The fighting lasted all day, with the defenders running out of ammunition. Just as their last rounds were expended, elements of the 142nd Infantry Regiment arrived, engaging the SS troops, capturing over 100 and killing or scattering the rest. The only death on the defenders' side was Gangle, who was hit after shoving a prisoner out of danger, though four others were wounded, ending one of the strangest battles of World War II. You know, I've always been fascinated by how things work, especially math, data, and computer science. And if you're like me, curious and eager to learn, then I've got something amazing to share with you. Imagine learning these complex subjects in a way that's not only interactive, but really fun. That's what Brilliant offers. With thousands of lessons covering everything from basics to more advanced topics, and with new lessons added every month, it's like an ever-expanding universe of knowledge. Take their new course on artificial intelligence, for example. You're not just reading about AI, you're actually engaging with interactive puzzles that teach you how neural networks operate. It's kind of like playing a game, but you're learning a real-world concept. The best part? Brilliant customizes content to fit your skill level. Whether you're just starting Starting out or you're ready to dive deep into data analysis or programming, there is something there for you. You progress at your own pace with helpful hints and step-by-step -step solutions to guide you. If you sign up now, you get to start free for 30 days. Plus, the first 200 people who sign up using the discount URL will get 20% off an annual plan. Just visit brilliant.org slash simple history to get started. Give it a try yourself to see what I'm talking about. Luftwaffe fighter escorts American bomber. On December 20th, 1943, a flight of B-17 heavy bombers were making their way to Bremen, Germany, targeting a factory that produced the FW-190 fighters. One of these, nicknamed Ye Old Pub, was piloted by Charlie Brown. As they made their approach, German anti-aircraft flak guns opened up with devastating effect. The barrage tore open the plexiglass nose, sending sub-zero winds into the aircraft. Subsequent hits knocked out one engine and damaged another. With power reduced, the bomber fell out of formation and was immediately surrounded by swarms of German fighters. In the ensuing fight, another engine was damaged, the tail gunner was killed, the rest of the crew wounded, and the defensive guns reduced to the dorsal turret and single nose gun. Brown turned the plane and headed towards England, but with any hope of safely reaching there, rapidly fading. As Ye Old Pub limped home, the wounded and frozen crew were greeted by a baffling sight. To the side of the bomber was a German Messerschmitt Bf 109, flown by Franz Stigler, who, instead of finishing off the crippled flying fortress, waved. 
After seeing the condition the men were in, he could not bring himself to finish them off. Stigler tried to signal Brown to land the bomber safely in Germany or to neutral Sweden, where they could land and be interned. Brown was confused as to what Stigler was trying to communicate and continued to pilot his crippled plane towards England. Rather than abandon them, Stigler flew in close formation with the bomber, which prevented German anti-aircraft guns from firing at them. As they left German airspace, Stigler saluted before returning home. Brown managed to make the trip back to England, landing safely. Both Brown and Stigler would survive the war and would meet in much more peaceful circumstances in 1990 and would remain friends until their deaths in 2008. The Niche Incident When the Americans inadvertently helped the Axis side On November 7, 1944, the American 82nd Operations Group based in Italy was providing support for Soviet forces, particularly the 6th Guards Rifle Corps, which was making its way towards Belgrade. Near the town of Niche, Yugoslavia, now Serbia, a flight of P-38 Lightning fighter planes spotted what they thought was a convoy of German troops. There are multiple versions of what happened next. What can be agreed upon is that the Lightnings began an attack on the Soviet convoy, strafing it with machine guns and rockets, killing 34, including the 6th Guard Corps commander and destroying about 20 trucks. The Soviets called for their own fighters, thinking they were under attack from Luftwaffe FW-189s, which have a similar twin-body design as the P-38. When the Yak-9 and Yak-3 fighters arrived on the scene, they began dogfighting the Americans, which lasted about 15 minutes. A number of aircraft on both sides were shot down, though the exact figures are disputed. Eventually, the Americans realized they were fighting the Soviets and broke off the attack. Another wave of P-38s was inbound, but they were intercepted by the Soviet fighters who showed the Red Star on their aircraft, and they returned back to base without any further incident. To this day, there is no official reasoning for the engagement. Intelligence reports indicated that there were no German troops in the region, adding suspicion that the attack was deliberate. Additionally, the dogfight lasted for 15 minutes, with none of the Americans noticing the Red Star on the Soviet fighters, which looks nothing like the Luftwaffe Cross or Swastika. There are some reports that the Americans had made a navigation error and believed they were over enemy territory. The Soviets had also advanced much more quickly than anticipated, and their presence in the region may have been a surprise to the American forces. Officially, the incident was determined to be an unfortunate friendly fire incident, and the Americans sent an official apology to the Soviets. Though it may just be a case of mistaken identity, rumors persist that the attack was deliberate. It is impossible to determine, as much of the information on what had occurred is still classified to this day. American Pilot Defects by 1944, the war was going firmly in favor of the Allies, with the Axis forces suffering setbacks on both the eastern and western fronts. In spite of this, at least one Allied soldier took his chances, throwing his lot in with the Axis cause. Martin James Monty had joined the U.S. Army Air Corps, qualifying as a pilot and was sent to Karachi, India, now Pakistan, where his service was uneventful. In late 1944, Monty deserted, hitching a ride on a C-46 bound for Cairo, Egypt, then numerous stops until his destination of Pomigliano Airfield, north of Naples. Once there, he located a P-38 Lightning that was awaiting testing after repairs. He stole the plane and headed towards German-held Milan. Once there, he defected and spent some time as a prisoner of the suspicious Germans. Monty was later released after he convinced them of his sincerity. As to why he defected, he was an ardent anti-communist and believed that the war was a communist plot and that Germany and the U.S. should ally against the Soviet Union, their true enemy. He offered his services to the Nazi war effort and was sent to Berlin, where he began a radio broadcast urging his fellow Americans to stop fighting against Germany and turn their attention to the evil Soviets. Broadcasting under the name Martin Vitopt, his program lasted only a few sessions before his radio career ended. As for the plane he piloted, the Germans eagerly took possession of the P-38, repainting the craft with their own markings, which was then used by the Luftwaffe until the end of the war. As the war ended, Monty escaped Berlin and made his way back to Italy, where he turned himself in to the Americans. He was taken into custody and later charged with desertion, receiving a 15-year suspended sentence. It wasn't until 1948 when his defection and propaganda activities were discovered. He was charged with treason and faced a potential death penalty. Monty pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment and a $10,000 fine, though he was paroled in 1960. He tried, without success, to have his conviction overturned, eventually dying in 2000. 
British, French, and Norwegian SS units. The Waffen-SS was the military arm of the German Nazi party, outside of the Wehrmacht. In spite of being associated with a German political party, the SS eagerly recruited members from other nations, placing them in combat roles. In German-occupied Norway, large numbers of Norwegians joined the German military in all of its branches, including the Wehrmacht, the Kriegsmarine, and the Luftwaffe. Overall, around 50,000 Norwegians fought for the Third Reich, with large numbers also joining the Norwegian Legion, an SS unit founded in 1941. After their formation, the Legion was deployed to the Leningrad Front, where they participated in the protracted siege of the city. After enduring heavy casualties as a result of heavy Soviet counterattacks, the Legion would be disbanded in 1943. Those who wished to continue fighting for the SS were transferred over to the newly formed 11th Volunteer Panzer Grenadier Division Nordland, where they continued to fight for the Germans. In addition to the Norwegians, the Nordland Division also contained a large number of Danes who also joined the Nazi cause, and by the end of the war, volunteers from Hungary, the Netherlands, Britain, Finland, Romania, France, Spain, Switzerland, Estonia, and Sweden had joined or been attached to the unit. The Nordland Division would continue to fight until the war's end in 1945, with many fighting to the death against the Allied advance. Those that were captured were often repatriated to their home countries in order to face trial for treason. Some SS units were recruited out of desperation. By 1944, Germany was losing ground on all fronts and desperately needed manpower to plug the gaps. Known as the British Free Corps, the unit was made up of British and Commonwealth POWs, recruited with the intention of fighting the Soviets. The results were less than inspiring. Information about the British Free Corps is difficult to obtain, though it's estimated that at its height it consisted of around 27 members. A few of the men were dedicated to the proposed mission, but the majority were inept or incapable combatants bordering on incompetent, some with extensive criminal and disciplinary records against them. Most of the men looked for any opportunity to desert, and the BFC never saw combat with the unit disbanded shortly after its creation. In German-dominated Vichy France, the SS also recruited another unit, one whose quality was the complete opposite. The 33rd Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, also known as the 1st French SS Division and the Charlemagne Division, was founded in 1944, made up from other French units that had served with the Third Reich as early as 1941, such as the Legion of French Volunteers Against Bolshevism, or LVF and the 8th Volunteer Sturmbrigade France, which saw action on the Eastern Front. In 1944, both of these units were disbanded and reformed into the 33rd Grenadier Division. At its height, the division had around 7,000 members, though heavy fighting whittled down this number to a mere 700 by April 1945. About half were sent to assist a construction battalion, while the rest were deployed to Berlin. There, they were assigned to guard the Führer's bunker. They fought fiercely, knowing the fate that awaited traitors, fighting the Soviets almost to the last man, and was one of the last units to offer resistance in the German capital, the 30 or so survivors surrendering on May 2, 1945. Of the members who escaped, some made their way to France, where they were captured by the Allies. Some were put on trial and sentenced to prison, though many were shot on the spot as traitors to their homeland. In the deadliest conflict in world history, members of the Axis and Allied Armed Forces, due to personal convictions, ideology, or any other reason known only to them, set aside their differences and worked alongside one another. Remember, that's brilliant.org slash simple history. I can't wait to hear about what you'll discover on your next own learning journey with Brilliant. Leave a comment below and tell me what you learned.